Well, good evening, Berean. It's good to be with you this evening as we commence our spring conference. And uh, it's exciting uh, to uh, have changed it up a little bit. We, uh, we had never had something like this in the spring, so I'm anticipating this time uh, and what it's going to mean for our church moving forward. And so this evening, really this week, we are going to focus on the subject, Who Am I?, and uh, this has been graciously laid out for us by Pastor Perkins. If you don't like it, talk to him. <laughs> but uh, but I, th I think you're going to enjoy it. <laughs> I, believe, I believe you're going to enjoy it. And it's going to be encouraging for us <clears throat> and uh, for our understanding of, of who we are. But also it's going to enable us to be better parents, better grandparents, better cousins, better, better aunties, better in every capacity that we serve, we're going to be better people, I believe, having uh, addressed this subject and looked into it over this, these next few days. So why don't I open it with a prayer, and then we'll, we'll jump right in. And this is more like Sunday evening rather than Sunday morning, so I will stop for questions if you raise your hand. I'm not going to shoot you down and keep rolling. So if you have a question, feel free to stop me while I'm in the process of teaching. Heavenly Father, we do want to give you thanks uh, for this evening. Thank you, Lord God, for watching over us, allowing us to be here tonight as we begin our spring conference. We pray that you would uh, teach us. Uh, we um, have a really challenging subject this week, and we, we want to understand who we are in a clearer way. We want to be better citizens of this country so that we can more intelligently interact with other people who are struggling with their identity but we also want to be better church members, able to teach the young people and give them direction and guidance in their life. And we want to be better people as well. And so we pray that on every level you would take what we learned this week and help us to apply it in our different contexts, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I do want to welcome, welcome you those who are joining us online. Sorry for not acknowledging you when we started. It's good to have you sitting in with us for our fall conference. So who am I? Uh, this is really a, a question that mankind has always asked himself and has answered the, the question in various ways, really resulting in either hopefulness or hopelessness. Uh, that modern man has been answering this question incorrectly is patently clear from the, the hopelessness that has come to define modern existence. I think all of us, uh, if we watch the news, if we read the paper, if, if anybody does that anymore. Um, we, we, we're watching a very hopeless culture, a very hopeless society. And one does not have to engage very long or very deeply with modern Western culture to realize that we are in an age really of confusion. And I would even say despair when it comes to the matter of personal identity. And there's a reason why uh, people are killing themselves at an enormous rate. And there's a level of despair in our culture and our country, and really all Western societies. Where did this come from? Well, when, when the cultural pressures that molded the greatest generation of our country faded post-World War II, the subsequent generations found it found it ever more difficult to find a driving force behind fulfilling their pattern of life that had really defined the previous generation. Uh, this, this shift, I think, uh, you know, it's, it's difficult to, to kind of put your finger on when the shift takes place, but I kind of think that poetically uh, that the shift is reflected in, in a movie that is really getting ready to experience its 69th anniversary this year. Rebel Without a Cause. Rebel Without a Cause. Uh, through that movie, you, f you see young people struggling to define themselves in light of the older generation, who, who we're going to be. And really, from that point on, teenage angst has served really as a jumping off point of many Hollywood movies, uh, fixated on this idea of where do we fit in the world? In fact, many of us may have struggled with that ourselves. Maybe we, maybe we went to high school with people who were struggling with where they fit in the world. Uh, Pre-World War II, that wasn't necessarily 
the case. I mean, you, you grew up kind of knowing where you were going to fit in, <laughs> or what you were going to do. But things changed post-World War II societally. And so who I am really has become an issue for really an ever-broadening part of our society and culture. More as generations move on, we have more and more and more generations looking to define themselves, trying to define themselves, trying to figure out where they fit in the world. But, but the cultural stability, the cultural stability of pre-World War II America should not be confused with Christianity. That wasn't Christianity. You see, this type of question was not limited to modern man. Uh, maybe we have not answered it very well, but I believe that the, that the question who I am really predates our present context. I, I would say it, 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 it predates our nation's existence. People have always been asking, who am I? It's not just a modern teenager on TikTok wondering who they are. Okay? This, is, this has been something that we've always asked ourselves. Who am I? In fact, to turn to Genesis, uh, sorry, uh, Psalm, Psalm chapter 8. In, in Psalm chapter 8, I, I believe that, that, the, that, that the psalmist here is asking this type of question. He's, he's struggling with comprehending, who am I? I see, I see, that, I see this struggle here in, in, the, in the rhetorical questions voiced in Psalm 8. Uh, in this psalm, as the psalmist considered the glory of the Lord and man's place in the created order, we hear a couple of we, we, we hear him form a couple of riveting questions. Listen to these questions in, in Psalm eight verses three and four. When I consider the heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars, which thou hast ordained, what is man? See that? What is man that thou dost take thought of him, and the son of man that thou dost care for him? Do you see how the psalmist is trying to figure out, you know, the, 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 the psalmist looks at the created order and sees the, the grandeur of it, sees the majesty of it, and then asks, where do I fit in that? You know, I mean, look at the moon, look at the stars, look at the sun. It's clearly these are majestic, powerful things. And who am I? I mean, he's, he, he's recognizing the insignificance of humanity. But watch what happens. As, as the psalmist meditates on the biblical worldview, he moves from insignificance and questioning to confession. He moves from question to confession. He, even though man was insignificant, when compared to the majesty of the rest of the order, the psalmist, in spite of that, has to make a confession. Listen, listen to him confess from his biblical worldview, verses 5 and 6. Yet thou hast made him a little lower than God and hast crowned him, see that, with glory and majesty. Thou dost make him to rule over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things under his feet. Do you see what, what has happened here? The, the, the psalmist looked at the world and said, who am I? I mean, I'm, just, I'm just a little old nobody. But then he, he's reminded of what the Bible says, that God has created man to rule, and then he remembers, I'm over the creation. <laughs> it, it, it doesn't really make sense. I'm, I'm insignificant, but God has created me to rule. And his biblical worldview kicks in and informs him as to who he is. And he accepts what the Bible says and acts on that. Now, as I continue through this psalm, see, my question then was, where does this, where does this majesty that man is endowed with come from? He's He's insignificant in, create, in relationship to the created order, but he's over it, so he's significant. 
He's been crowned with majesty. Then watch the last verse of this psalm, verse 9. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic. Where did man's majesty come from? How majestic is thy name in all the earth? Do you see where the majesty of man derived from? It derived from God. So what, what has this psalm told us? Watch what this, what, watch what this psalm has, has done. This psalm has told man that he's comparable to God and comparable to the creation. As he looked at the creation, he, he realized, I'm part of it, but I'm, I'm a nobody. I'm insignificant. But then he remembered what the, what the Bible taught, and he said, oh, but I've been put over the world, so I've been crowned with majesty. The majesty comes from God. So the psalmist realizes that he's between two worlds. He's comparable to God, and he's comparable to the creation as well. He, he fits into the created order, while at the same time having some of the majesty that ultimately characterizes God. The psalmist confessed that man is connected both to God and the created order at the same time. In other words, watch this. Man occupies a special and unique place in God's world. Man possesses a special and unique place in God's world. No other being can say what the psalmist said. There's only one being in the universe that can say that, that is between these two worlds, that is comparable both to God and the created order in this way, and that's mankind. Well, <clears throat> as I thought about this psalm, I realized that this psalm is referring to the conclusion of the created work. What is man? He's the byproduct of God's work. So, so Psalm 8 is focusing on the byproduct. My question after I meditate on this psalm is, well, where's the blueprint? Genesis, of course, right? If, if Psalm 8 is the, by, is the byproduct, is the end product, then Genesis 1 and 2 is the blueprint that informs us how God accomplished. How did God accomplish something crazy like this? Creating, creating a being that was in between two different worlds. How did, how did God accomplish that? Well, Genesis 1 and 2 tells us. Here we see the blueprint of man. Now, <clears throat> over the years, you've heard me spend a lot of time in Genesis 1 and 2. I'm not going to take time this evening uh, to give you the background of the book and why these two first three chapters are important. I mean, you all have heard me do it like a million times. Uh, I would just re refer you to some previous series, both my series on marriage, my series on the image of God. I've, ta I've taught on marriage a couple of times. I, whenever I do, I always go to Genesis 1 and 2. So if you want more background on why these two chapters, particularly 1 and 2, are so essential, you can just drop into any of those previous series and they'll give you all the information that you need. And so we're just going to jump right in here to Genesis 1 and 2. Now, let me kind of remind you what's going on here in a very abbreviated form. The, the, there are two accounts of creation. You all know that. The first account, <clears throat> which occupies Genesis 1, essentially, gives the reader what you've heard me call an inventory of creation an inventory of creation. Uh, God is simply saying, day one, this is what we did. Day two, this is what we did. Day three, day four, day five. This is so it's just, it, it's a running inventory of creation. And so that, that's what Genesis 1 is, is trying to accomplish. Now, as you read this running commentary, this running inventory of the created order, it becomes very, very clear that day six is not like day one through five, okay? I mean, he, he, just, just a, a surface reading without any type of deep study. You know, you, you don't have to have your notebook open. It's just a, a basic reading, you, you know, day one, day two, day three, day four, day five, and then all of a sudden it says, God began speaking to God. 
on day six. And that, that immediately tells you what, what's going on. Something's going on. Here. We don't know what's going on yet. Okay. <clears throat> Fully. But it has to do with man. So, something is going on with the creation of mankind. And so uh, we, we have to wait until Genesis 2 to get more of the story. Okay. What's so unique about man? Well, he, well of course, we, we see his uniqueness. In, in, I don't want to say that we don't see it in Genesis 1. Of course we do. But, but how he created them, we really get a chance to see that in Genesis chapter 2. In Genesis 2, the focus of God was on day 6 itself and the creation of man. And uh, God uh, explores this with greater depth. It's here in Genesis 2 that we come to really our first and most fundamental issue necessary to understand who we are. And so uh, we're going to spend some time here, really the rest of our time, uh, trying to understand what's going on. And basically what we're going to see is that in the creation of man, we see the fusion, here's, the, here's my main point, the fusion of the material and the immaterial into one. That's what we see here. We see that we see the fusion, the fusion of the material and the immaterial into one being. That's unique. That's unique. In fact, that's nowhere else in the created order but with human beings. And so this is what Pat and I are referring to as the foundation of human existence. This is the foundation of human existence. Uh, we're, I'm, I was tasked with talking about the foundation of human existence. And the, its foundation is that we are material and immaterial beings. That's who we are in our essence. <clears throat> so let's look at, let's do first thing, an overview of this uh, creation order at Genesis uh, chapter 1. Now, as we go through Genesis chapter 1, as I said, it's a running inventory. When you get to uh, verse 24, uh, here we have uh, God uh, beginning on the sixth day. Of course, he creates the land animals. But then in, in verse 25, something unusual happens. And God made, sorry, uh, verse 26, something unusual happens. It says, then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness and let them rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over, every, and over the cattle and over the, all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Here in the 26th verse, we have God indicate that man was created to rule, to have dominion. Now, this is the very thing that we saw in, in Psalm 8. In Psalm 8, the, uh, the psalmist transitioned in his mind when he, when he realized, although I'm looking up at the stars and I'm insignificant, I'm ruling this stuff. And so it was, it was the rule of God, it was his being commissioned as a ruler that allowed him to transition and, and think properly about himself. All right? And so this is where the psalmist obviously got that from. Here, uh, where God commissions man to rule. But even before the idea of rulership comes up, we, we see here in this text the idea of being made in the image of God, the image and the likeness of God. Now, I, I'm not, I'm not going to uh, have a series on the image of God. If you want to go into more detail, I just go to the app and you have a really in-depth study of the image of God. I'm not going to do that this, uh, this evening. All I want to do is establish when, when the Bible says the image of image and likeness of God, what, what, what he's ultimately saying here is that God provides the model for who we are. God provides the model for who man is. In the, in the series on the image of God, I, I said over and over again, you can't fully understand yourself until you understand God because you're made in his image. And so he's the model that provides us with who we are. Now, notice in Genesis 1 that we're not told how God did this. All God says is, let's do it. And then in verse 27, guess what? It's done. And we don't, we don't kind of see, well, you, you made, you're going to do this, but we don't see how he did it. All we see is that he did it. We see the finished product of man modeled after God and in the form of male and female. We don't see how God did that. Now, 
This chapter is important, however, because what it does is it, it informs us that the human race was made under the headship of the male. That's pretty clear. The, the human race is called man. It's not called woman. It's called man. That's, that's, that's biblical headship, okay, whether we like that or not. The, the, the modern world doesn't like that, but who cares about the modern world? Uh, that's what God says, all right? And so we see here male headship. But we also see here, again, this is Genesis chapter 1, equality between the, the sexes. You say, equality, where do you see that, Pastor? Well, the hymn is a them. The hymn is a them. Who is man? Who is, who is the hymn, male and female? There is no hymn without them. That is the true essence of what a human being is, male and female. And so Genesis chapter 1 is important, but it doesn't really give us the details that we need to understand how God accomplished making us as unique as he made us. And so we have to move on to Genesis chapter 2. Here we have a more detailed description of, of what's going on. That, that should not say man's creation, an overview. That should say man's creation, a detailed description. That's what happens when you don't proof your slides. A detailed description. Now, <clears throat> here, God places the spotlight squarely upon what took place during day six specifically in reference to mankind. It's here that we learn that the male and the female were not made at the same time on day six. Now, coming out of chapter one, it'd be easy to think, well, they're made at the same time, but they're not. In fact, they're made in different, in, in different moments, they're made. And this is done intentionally by God. Not an accident, not an oops. God is doing this on purpose. There are, those of you who just came in, there are some notes. I don't know, uh, if, I don't know if you, you, you uh, got them back there. Okay, so uh, I think some people need some notes in the back. If, if, if there's some left over. If not, we can make some copies. So <clears throat> it's just, they're just blank outlines you, you can kind of fill in. So here we see God intentionally, intentionally, making men and women at a different time. So although they're equal, coming out of Genesis chapter 1, it's clear that, they, that God intended them to function differently within their relationship, particularly in the relationship of marriage. Now, now again, my, my purpose is not to talk about marriage. I don't want to talk about never marriage uh, in, uh, th this evening. But, but God creates them at different times, demonstrating a difference of function, that they're not the same. Now, the creation of the woman, this is going to kind of sound kind of strange, so just let, it, let, 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 let it kind of flow over you first before you kind of say, that, that, that's insane. The, the, the creation of the woman was, was not to bring, God didn't create the, wo the woman in order to bring a human into existence because humans already existed. Adam already existed. So God wasn't bringing humans into existence for the first time when he made Eve. God was intending to bring a special type of human being into existence. The woman is unique in all the created order. Do you know that females... There are, three type of, there are three types of persons in the universe. God, man, and angels. The only persons, the only species in which females exist is mankind. She's unusual. <laughs> She's special. God was doing something off the chain when he made a female. And so God is bringing a special type of human being into existence when he creates the woman. 
somebody unique, somebody... This is why Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 7, makes this radical statement. He says that man is the glory of God, but the woman is the glory of man. She's man. She's mankind in its highest form. If you want to see mankind in its highest form, look at a woman. You get to see what men, what, what the human beings are like in their, in their greatest capacity. If you want a more detailed analysis of this, of course, you can listen to my series on marriage or on the image of God. Our focus here, however, is not on marriage and males and females relating to each other, but our focus is on their ontological nature as human beings. So who are they as human beings, whether they're male or female? Well, in order to, in order to, to find this out, we have to delve into Genesis 2 and man's creation, this, this detailed description of the creation. The first thing we see here in this detailed description is its impetus. It's impetus. What led God, what led God to create mankind? Now, of course, the answer is easy. Um, it was a sovereign plan. I mean, Genesis chapter one is pretty clear. God, God is having a conversation with God. It says, let's make man in our image. So that's what he does. But, uh, but I'm, I'm now looking for a more immediate cause of the creation. Um, clearly, in Genesis two, uh, verses 4 and 5, we have the creation account beginning. It begins for the, the, the uh, second account begins in verse 4. And what we notice at the beginning here in verses 4 and 5 is that there are two needs. There are two needs that surface in these verses. Uh, of course, uh, you all have heard me teach on this before. But uh, verse 4 and 5, this is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God made earth and heaven. Now no shrub of the field was yet in the earth and no plant of the field had yet sprouted for the Lord had not, caught, had not sent rain upon the earth and there was no man to cultivate the ground. And so here we learn in these verses that the ground had great potential. It had great c capacity, but in its present state, it couldn't produce at the highest level that it could have. It was, it was short of something. Two things were, were missing from the ground being able to execute its mission with excellence. One was water, and the other was, was, was man, particularly in, in this context, a male, M-A-L-E. There was no water, and there was no male. The next two sentences, Verses 6 and 7 tell us how God alleviated, how he fixed the dilemma. Verse 5, of, 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 of verse 5. In verse 6, we have the record of how God solved the water problem. But a mist used to rise from the earth and water the whole surface of the ground. That's how the water problem was fixed. And then we learn in the seventh verse how God fixed the male, the man problem. Then the Lord God formed man from dust from the ground and breathed in his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living being. Here we have one of the most important statements in all of scripture as to who human beings are. In this statement, I see the tactical excellence of God. I mean, God is something else. I mean, the, 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 way, the way he solved this problem was masterful. First here we see human materiality. Just, 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 just look, at what, <laughs> look at what God does here. He, 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 just look at the master builder at work. We have, we have some engineers in the room. Just, just, just look at a real engineer. In, in the first clause, that's then the Lord God formed man of dust on the ground. In the first clause, we see immediately that man is connected inseparably to the creation and to the task which brought forth his existence. 
I mean, in, in these simple words, it becomes clear. Man is, is connected with what you see, and his purpose is found in what you see. That, 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 in, this, in these brief words, it becomes very, very clear. However, if, if we've been reading from Genesis 1 through Genesis 2, it should become clear to us that there's a difference in the physicality of man and the physicality of the rest of the, of the created order. There's something about the physicality that, that's different. The physicality of the, of the animal life came into existence by what we call divine fiat. Divine fiat. Divine command. God commanded, and what happened? It was. I mean, what could it do but be, right? I mean, in the, in the, listen, to the, listen to the author of Hebrews, in Hebrews 11, verse 3, when he talks about how God created in a general way. Hebrews 11, verse 3, it says, By faith we understand that the worlds were prepared by the word of God so that what is seen <laughs> was made out of things that are invisible. So God just simply spoke it, and it had to happen. There, there was no way that it couldn't happen. There was a divine necessity in it. So everything that we see that's physical, except us, everything else that we see that's physical came into existence by God's command. God stated it, and it happened. We, however, don't get our physicality that way. God didn't do that for us. In a sense, God got down into the mud, right? He, 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 he went into the ground. He, 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 and not only did he go into the ground, he, he formed. He, he, what you have is a picture of a, of a, uh, of a potter going to the ground because he, he gets clay or mud and, and scooping some of that and then putting it on his wheel. And you know what? You know how the potter spins that wheel, and 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 and, and, he, and he forms he forms a, a a vessel. And so the the picture here is God getting down, getting some of the the uh, the uh, mud, the ground, the clay, and and he made our physicality by connection. Now. In this act of God, and you've heard me say this before, but God is meeting the need through the problem. The ground is the problem. And where does God go to solve the problem? He goes to the ground. The ground is having the issue, so God goes to the issue, takes a piece of it, and creates a solution. Of course, that helps us understand what he did with, with Eve as well. So all of, this, all of this speaks to intentionality. God, God is choosing to bring man into existence in a way that he didn't bring anything else into existence. I don't know if you knew this, but the, the word, although, although chapter one has talked about God making, making stuff, we don't hear the word form until this, until this. This is the first time we hear form in the, in the creation account, right here. And it's only, only with man, see? This is where it, this is where it happens first. Uh, of course, that's not a surprise for us, so we shouldn't be shocked from that coming out of Genesis chapter 1. In Genesis chapter 1, what do we see? We saw God stop for a moment and talk to himself about what he wanted to do with mankind. And bringing him into existence. So, so it's, it's, it's clear from Genesis chapter 1 that, that, that this is going to be a special act. And so we're not surprised that God has done it in this way. So what do we see here? W what we see is that although a part of the physical world, 
man became so in a special fashion, which distinguishes him from the rest of the created order. No other aspect of the physical world could claim to have come into existence the way we did. We're unique. We're unique. We're physical just like the world is. We're made out of the same stuff that the world is made out of. Animals, fish, birds, we're all made out of the same stuff. But we weren't made out of the same stuff the same way. Here we see even the uniqueness of our physicality. This is some of what the psalmist in Psalm 8 that we opened up with was marveling at. Human materiality. With that goes human immateriality. Human immateriality. We see this in the, in the second half of verse 7. He said he formed, he formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed in his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living being. Now, before we look at what God did, l l let me first draw your attention to the direct object here, the breath of life, the breath of life. Here we see that this act of God right here is where, is where our life is drawn from. This act brings us to life. It's the nexus of our life. What, why do we exist? Because God breathed into us. I, I know that your mom and dad got together, you got, and she got pregnant, and you were born. But the ultimate, the ultimate nexus of our existence is this act of God right here. We exist today because God brought us to life. Notice... I couldn't get past the specificity, the breath. He breathed in us, not a breath, the breath of life. And, 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 and this word life here is, is so critical. It's so critical. This, 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 this Hebrew term was used several times before verse 7. You, you might not have known that, but th this word is not appearing here for the very first time. The same word was used of sea life, Aquarian life. Verse 20 through 21, 2021 20, of, of chapter 1 uses the same word to describe fish, y'all. This word is used again in verses 28 and verse 30 to describe land animals. Hmm. So, we see from the use of this term, listen church, that the created world is marked by life. God brought into existence a living world filled with life. That's what God made. God made a living world packed full of life. Now, how should we understand this? Well, regarding this idea, <clears throat> I made a statement in my series on the image of God that I want I want to I want to re uh, just kind of repeat here. L this is what I said when we, when I did the image of God. The Hebrew term translated "living" was more often used was most often used to describe the principle that distinguished animate things from inanimate things. In other words, it usually described the life principle, the life principle, that which separated living beings from insentient ones. We're living, this couch is not. Right? And, and, and the, the, a thing that separates us is this life principle. And where did the life principle come from? 
came from God. Now, is that the only way to get the life principle? Some of you are shaking your head yes, but it's not. Why do I say that? Because fish got it. Cows have it. How'd they get it? Did God breathe into them? He created them, yes. How did they get it? By divine fiat, right? I mean, it, 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 God, God said for them to have life. So guess what they got? He could have done that with us, but he didn't. We got the life principle in a completely different way than the rest of the, of the living beings got the life principle. They got the life principle through divine fiat. We got the life principle by God breathing into us. That act of God animates us, the formed ground, and makes us a living being. This verse makes a direct connection between all creatures that inhabit the earth, including man. All of them are living beings. All of them are living creatures. But we are living creatures in a completely different way. We, we got animated. We got animated a completely different way, not by divine fiat, as all the other creatures did, but we got animated by divine translation or divine transmission. God transmitted the life principle to us by breathing into us. He, he breathed into us. And by that breath, we were then animated, became to life, yes. So, so is it wrong to say that other living creatures have the breath of God? Bob doesn't say that. So, so we can say that other, the other living creatures have life, but uh, the, the Bible never paints them as having the breath of life. So if, if they don't have... We would, if, if you hold on, I think you'll see why, because we would connect the breath of life to the image of God. So th they have a life principle in them, they're living beings, but they don't, they're not living the way that we're living. Our, our life is completely unique in the universe, yes? Does this breath of life have something to do with the fact that we're the only created beings that have souls? Animal you, you're, you're way ahead of me. You, you, that's, that's basically where I'm going. Let's, in fact, let's, let's go there. Uh, <clears throat> it's not only the nexus of man's life, it's the nexus of man's relationships. <laughs> what we don't realize is, is what we've just read tells us that God relates to man in a way that he doesn't relate to the rest of the creation. Do you, hope you, do you, do you see it yet? I hope you see it. What, what God is saying here is I don't relate to the rest of the creation like I relate to you. You're unique. You're unique. You're special. God relates to us in a more direct way, in a more in intimate way, in a more immediate and tangible way than he does with the rest of the creation. He simply spoke and they existed. That's not what he dealt with, with us. It was, it was different. It's, it was, it's, more, it's more tangible. It is in this aspect of man's origin that we see how God made us in his image. This is how God imparted his image to us. And it is the, and it is the reality of the image that allows us to have relationships both with God and with other men. 
Why can we have a relationship with other human beings? It's because of this. This is what allows us to relate and to relate in a, in a, in a, in a way that, that is real. Now, again, uh, the, uh, the, um, you, you, your dog can relate to you, but that's not, that's not the, he can't have a relationship like human to human, human to God. This, this, this is, a, this is a, an intimate, immediate, tangible type of re- relationships. Only human beings, only, the only physical being that can do that is a human being because they have the image of God based on this. One of my Hebrew teachers, Dr. Alan P. Ross, in his commentary on Genesis, writes the following, and I think he's, he's hit it on the nose here. He said, here the very breath of God is being given in a moment of inspiration. This breath brings more than animation to the man of earth. It brings spiritual understanding and a functioning conscience. In short, we may conclude that moral capacity is granted to human beings by virtue of this in-breathing, in-breathing. It, is, it truly is a breath of life that is, it produces life. It probably is this in-breathing that constitutes humankind as the image of God. According to Genesis 2, 7, the combining of the physical body and the divine breath produces the living being. The physical body and divine breath produces the living being. Like the animals, man is a living, breathing being. Unlike the animals, however, he arrived at that state in a way that is assured, that assuredly distinguishes him from the animals. That's my point. I mean, he's basically said what my point is. That, that how God did this not only attaches us to the world, it distinguishes us from the world. This is, this, is, this is Psalm 8. This is, what, this is what the psalmist was wrestling with as he wrestled with who am I? As, as he tried to identify himself. Who am I in this world? The biblical worldview at that moment of questioning comes to the psalmist and the psalmist realizes, oh, the Bible tells me who I am. Although I'm insignificant in the world, I'm significant because of what God meant what God made me, how God made me. Who am I? God breathed into man and man became a living being. And this is the nexus of really all human relationship. Church, this is only, this is only true of human beings. Only true of uh, he, the, the, a human is completely set aside in the created order. God designed us in a completely different manner, in, a, in an incomparable manner. Man exhibits, man exhibits the union of the material and the immaterial, unlike any other part of the creation. I can say with confidence, at this point, At this point in human history, Genesis 1, there was no other being that was like us. Of course, that changed when Christ took on human form, right? The incarnation. But prior to that, only human beings could fit that description. We're unique. This leads to the resultant union. This is what I've been trying to trying to trying to demonstrate this evening. In making man in his image, it would be easy to make this conclusion. God must be physical too. Can you see that? I mean, d- d- r- remove the rest of the Bible, okay? Because some of y'all are going, but pass, pass, don't remove the rest of the Bible. If you had Genesis 1 and 2, God said, God said, let us make man in our own image 
could you make the conclusion from that that God must be physical? Yeah, I'd make that conclusion. I mean, God, God is he, he's the model, and, and when he made us, he made us physical beings, so he must be physical himself. It'd be easy to make that conclusion. Of course, we have the rest of the Bible, don't we? <laughs> All right? And so with the rest of the Bible, we, we find out that, that that's not the case. Of course, we know what Jesus said in John 4 uh, when he was talking to the woman at the well, and probably the most explicit statement of the substance of God. What is, what is God made up of? Well, spirit. <laughs> it's not a substance. It's spirit. God is spirit, Jesus said, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. But what, what, is the Bible, what does the Bible mean? Uh, what does the Bible mean when it talks about God being spirit? Dr. Wayne Grudem has a, an excellent discussion in his systematic theology on what he calls the spirituality of God or, or God being a spirit. The first thing that he does is he warns us about what it doesn't mean, okay? And he reads as follows. Thus, we should not think of God as having size or dimensions, even infinite ones. Uh, we should not think of God's existence as a spirit as meaning that he is infinitely large. For example, for it is not part of God, but all, for it is not part of God, but all of God that is in every point of space. Nor should we think that God's existence as spirit means that God is infinitely small. For no place in the universe can surround him or contain him. Thus, God's being cannot be rightfully thought of in any terms of space. However, we understand this existence as spirit. He continues, we also find that God forbids his people to think of his very being as similar to anything else in the physical creation. We read in the Ten Commandments, you shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children of the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. The creation language in this commandment, heaven above or earth beneath or water under the earth, is a reminder that God's being, his essential mode of existence, is different from everything that he has created. You can't look in creation and try to see if you can figure out God. That's his point. It can't be done. A little further down, if you keep reading in this same chapter, in, in, the, in the very next page, he gives a positive description of what we mean when we talk about God being spiritual or being a spirit. He writes, God's spirituality means that God exists as a being that is not made of any matter, has no parts or dimensions, is unable to be perceived by our bodily senses and is more excellent than any other kind of existence. God is spirit. God is spirit. Now, what does that mean for us? That means that we too are spirit. If, if God in, his in, 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 his, in the essence of his existence, if he's spirit, and he made us in his image, then we must be spirit as well. Spirit, not on par with God, of course, but modeled from God in a contingent and a limited fashion. And of course, this is what the Bible affirms, does it not? Our sister Vicki argued, is, it, is this not the spirit of man? Yes, it is. Now, now Genesis 2 didn't tell us that necessarily, but that's the only conclusion that we can make. 
that God breathed into us, and in the breath of God, we have, the, we have our being endowed with the image of God and the spirit and, and, the, and, and the immaterial part of who we are, that we call a spirit, we call it a soul, call it a mind, call it a, a heart, whatever, how you want to call it. But it's the immaterial us. That's derived from God. And, and what, I'm gonna, what I'm arguing here this evening is that it is in that aspect of who we are that we're the most like God. If God is spirit, I'm not saying that the physical is not important. But I want, I want to say if, if God is spirit, we're most like him in, 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 in that we are spirit beings as well. Now, it, it's hard for us to think that we're spirit beings. Why? Because we look in the mirror and we see ourselves. But this is, this is where the biblical worldview has to kick in. How many people... <laughs> I, you don't want to ask a question. How many people in this world fixate on their physical? Yeah. Most of us, yes. Mm-hmm. Isn't this the problem with the world? They don't spend any time on the most essential part of their being. That separates us. I mean, we, we, we as Christians, of course, spend time on it, right? We pray, or we should be praying. We, we, we read the Bible, or we should be reading the Bible, right? We, we're meditating on Scripture. We're, we're worshiping at church. We're fellowshipping with other believers. So we're working on, this, on, on the Spirit. But just think of all the people in the world and all the despair in the world because people are ignoring the very essence of who they are. We are, while while God is immaterial in a way that is hard for us to understand, we also understand that we are immaterial as well. And we became immaterial from what God did in Genesis 2, verse 7. Well, this leads me to another question. I I, I had so many questions. As I I worked through this, I had questions after my question. So after I established that, I had another question. If in our most essential being, it's the spirit side of us, why did God give us bodies? And so I started thinking about that. Yes, yes, and Pam is way ahead of me as usual. Our, 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 our physical bodies allow us to operate within the, within the physical realm. Right? Our physical bodies allow us to operate in the physical realm. But watch this. I'm going to put a, I guess I'm going to put a, uh, what is that, a, an adjective on that or, or an adverb? Naturally. What is that, Pat? Is that an adverb or is it, that's an adverb, right? What is it? Our physical bodies allow us to operate within the physical realm naturally. Adverb? Yeah. Operate naturally. So, it allows us to operate naturally. Naturally. Now, why would, I, why would I describe it that way? Well, let me, let me illustrate this for you. We, we, we've established that there were three persons in the universe. Three types of persons. There's the divine type of person. And that can never increase or decrease. <laughs> okay, that's... that's that's God. Then there's angelic type of persons. They're, they're persons too. They can't increase or decrease in number, not because they're like God, but because God limited them in creation. Then there's us. Okay, there's we can increase, and they can, we can become more of us, and that's the whole point, like when God says, be fruitful and multiply, right? Because we, we can more and more and more and more of us. Now, I want to focus on these these middle ones, these these angels. Okay, let's 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 talk about them for a second. What what are they in their substance? They're spirits, right? I mean, the Bible pretty much the the Bible calls 
angel spirits. In fact, the uh, Hebrews uh, 1, 13 to 14 calls them ministering spirits. Uh, Acts 19, 12 through 23 talks about evil spirits. So both demons and angels are referred to as spirits. But they can show up. I'm sorry? In the world. I'm sorry? But they can show up physically in the world. Uh, just hold on. Just, just follow me here. So these are spirit beings. Because they're spirits, they're not naturally able to operate within the physical world. They're not naturally able to operate in the physical world on a physical level. They are not even visible unless they are made to be seen. When's the last time you, you saw an angel? Never. 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 <laughs> well, if you haven't seen them, they, they mustn't exist, right? They're, they're invisible to us unless God does something. So turn to 2 Kings chapter 6. 2 Kings chapter 6. I'm trying to prove my point here that our physical bodies allow us to operate within the physical realm naturally. In 2 Kings chapter 6, the Arameans army surrounded Elisha and his servant, and they were scared to death. So scared that in verse 15, Isaiah, uh, sorry, Elisha's servant Fright, frightening, frightfully asks Elijah what they're going to do. What, what, what can we do? We're surrounded. Listen to Elijah's response in 2 Kings 6, 16 and 17. So he answered, do not fear. For those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Huh? What? Then Elijah prayed and said, O oh Lord, I pray, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the servant's eyes, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. Here we have the normally unseen world of the angelic hosts manifested in the physical world. Doesn't always happen. It's, not, it's unusual. Okay? But here we have it revealed. So the reason we were given these bodies was because of, was because of the reason for our creation. And that's our responsibility to rule the physical world. This is why we were given physical bodies. We have bodies so our immaterial essence Watch this, church. We have bodies so that our immaterial essence, who we are, might be expressed or projected into the physical world. How, how is a spirit going to be projected into the physical world? How is, how is the spirit, how is a spirit going to operate in a physical world? Got to have a physical body. So who we are on the inside, the essence of who we are, because we, 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 we God is spirit, and so we are most like him in that aspect of who we are. That is projected in the physical world through these, through these bodies. Now, while the immaterial aspect of who we are can exist without a physical body, the physical body can't exist without who we are our soul. So the immaterial you doesn't need a body to exist, to exist. But Paul establishes that in two places. Well, Paul establishes it in 1 Corinthians 5, 1 through 10. I'm not going to turn there. And we, we also see this in, in Revelation 6, 9 through 11. The, the immaterial you doesn't need a body. Now, that doesn't mean that doesn't mean that you're comfortable without a body. Just in the same way as you don't need clothes to be a human. 
but I sure am more comfortable with clothes on, particularly if I'm, if I'm in public, <laughs> right? That's the, that's the way your soul feels, according to 2 Corinthians 5. It can exist without a body, but it's not natural. It, it needs to have a body, all right? And so Paul establishes this. Revelation establishes this. This means, but, by the mere fact that the soul can exist without a body, but a body can exist without a soul, that tells us that the nexus of our humanity, the foundation of who we are as humans, is found in our inner man. It's found in our inner man. As such, if our inner man is going to operate naturally in the physical world, then we're going to have to do so through the physical body. So, I ask myself another question. How does the soul project itself into the physical world? How does the immaterial us where our personhood dwells, the immaterial us, how does that express itself in a physical world? <laughs> Watch this. The immaterial us harnesses the capacities of the physical body, including the senses, to both collect and analyze data and then uses its capacities to evaluate that data and, and sketch out a course of action for us as people. Now, we do this in a, in a, a way that's past any supercomputer. I, this happens to me all the time. Um, I'm doing something in the kitchen and something sl slips from my hand, and before it hits the ground, I catch it. How does that happen? Have you ever thought about it? How does that happen? Reflexes. Reflexes so it's not, it, I, I, I have no control over it? There's something else going on. I mean, ju just think of all of the, all of the, your, 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 your eyes, which are senses, are realizing something's falling, it goes back to your brain and says, if, if you let it fall, it's going to be a problem. The brain then marshals the hand and maybe the arm and maybe even the whole leg or body to move in the direction that it's falling. It then reaches out and grabs it before. Do you know the type of calculations you got to go through for that to happen? This way, into this way, when, 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 when people talk about it, artificial intelligence, <laughs> I have, I, have, I have no worry about them being able to build a computer that can become human. It can't happen. The, the, the type of tabulations necessary, you'd have to have a whole world full of computers to even begin to even touch what God did. It, it, it's, 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 un, it's unreal. So, so how does the soul, which is not physical, project itself into a physical world? The soul has capacities. It has functions. What are those capacities it has? It has a mind, the ability to think. It has emotions, the ability to feel and relate. And it has a will, ability to, to make decisions. The immaterial you has capacities that it uses to manipulate the physical you and the faculties that the physical you has. You can hear, you can, you can see, you can smell. I mean, all these, all these capacities your physical body has. Who's controlling the physical body? Not the physical body. <laughs> the physical body is being controlled by the immaterial you. And that is how you operate in the physical world. The mind, the emotions, and the will are central to how you can operate. But even, but even our physicality, even our physicality, I don't know if you thought about this, is a reflection of God. I'm not, uh, 
I don't want us to walk away this evening thinking that I'm most like God, which I am in my immaterial aspect, but my physical aspect is just not like God. Well, no, that's like God too. Who you are physically is also like God. How do I know that? Can God see? The Bible says so, right? Can God hear? Mm -hmm. Can he smell? Does he have eyes, ears, or noses? No. So God has abilities that the senses represent without a physical body. So the fact that we can hear, smell, and see is because that's the nature of a physical body. Is that the nature of God? It's the nature of God. It's the nature of God. Even in my, phys even in my physicality, I'm in the image of God. So, so it's not the spiritual part of me is in the image of God and the physical part of me is not. No, all of you, all of you is in, all of you is the image of God. All of you is the image of God. But the essential essence of your existence is your soul, your immaterial aspect of who you are. Man, the psalmist was right. The psalmist was right. Although man is insignificant in comparison to the mighty and majestic creation. He is yet majestic himself due to how God brought him into existence. Man is unique. And I wish we could stop there. But something happened. Yeah, somebody, somebody, so you said, man, shoot. <laughs> yeah, something happened. Didn't, didn't stay, didn't stay good all the time. Now, <clears throat> I have more notes than I have time for, so I'm not going to go over, all, I'm not going to go over all this. I'm not going to go over all this. So l let me try to kind of summarize here, because I, I do want to leave two minutes or a minute for, for any questions. <laughs> so, um, first off, I didn't plan to, uh, I, when I said the fall, uh, this is this is my section on the fall. I hadn't planned I hadn't planned to go over what happened in the fall because you've been taught that already. So uh, uh, my focus this evening was was going to be what has fall what has the fall done to how people answer the question who who am I? So it's not it's not what happened in the fall. You all know what happened in the fall. Okay, we we uh, we were we were distorted. We were distorted. But now when people ask the question, who, who am I, how do they answer that? Well, they, answered it, they answer it in a distorted way. That was the point I wanted to make this, this evening, that, that, that people answer this question in a distorted way because they don't know who they are. I, I talked about what, what, what I called earlier in, in the message, teenage delinquency. You know, what the, the Rebel Without a Cause movie that I, that, that I talked about. Well, it, 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 it used to be that a teenage delinquent was somebody who, you know, skipped school every now and then, maybe, maybe snuck a, a smoke from some cigarettes they found or took a little sip from a bottle that their older brother had bought. I'm not talking from personal experience. <clears throat> <laughs> uh, that was the extent of teenage delinquency. What does teenage delinquency look like nowadays? Yeah. Armed carjacking, shoplifting syndicates, widespread drug addiction, murder. I mean, teenage delinquency has gone through the roof. People have redefined who they are. When they ask the question, who am I, they don't ever go past the physical. Their, Im their immediate human passions drive them. And it only, it's only gotten worse, not better. What really is, I need to pick up the pace here. What, 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 what really is shocking to most of us, however, is the moral perversion that has 
become the touch tone of our society. Where at one time boys simply struggled with what type of man will I be? Or what type of the girls struggled with will I be like my mother or someone else? Today we have boys wanting to be girls and girls wanting to be boys. With the, with the normalization of homosexuality and then transgenderism, we have seen a great transformation of our culture. And it's bad enough that we have segments of our culture that have embraced this, but what's even become worse for us as living in this culture is that we have individuals who embrace and propagate the brutalization of minors through drugs and surgery to fulfill these perverted visions for humanity. Now, whenever you get on a subject like this, uh, sometimes the younger generation can look at us old people, well, old folks here tonight, except Ken, of course. Ken is, is, a, is a baby over there. <laughs> but the rest of us are, are, are old, old folks. Uh, but s s sometimes the, the younger generations look at, look at older people like us, and they say that we're living in the past, right? They, they say, stop clutching your pearls, right? That, that's a, that's a, I don't know if that they still say, well, kids don't use that, but that's what we used to say in our day and age. You're clutching your pearls. That, 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 that the, times have changed, and you need to go along with the change, right? You know, stop, stop, stop trying to take us back. I mean, it's just, there's no way to, to get back. It's, just, it's here. Whether you like it or not, you better learn how to adjust. But as I thought about that, <laughs> What I thought about was long before our culture became sophisticated like this, God had, God had already talked on all this stuff. These type of c conclusions that, that people are drawing today are things that God has already addressed in the Bible. I don't have time to go into all of this, but let me just kind of, I mean, Homosexuality goes back to Genesis chapter 18. And not only did God destroy it, but Jesus used the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah as a prototype for all type of destruction. So Jesus was saying, yeah, God did the right thing. And then Paul himself said that when, when, a, when, a, when a culture gets out of hand, what, what, what happens? This type of homosexual behavior happens. We see that I had planned to go through the scriptures, but I don't have time. But even trans, I don't know if you thought about it, it's even transgenderism. Many people are making the decision nowadays to become the opposite gender. Christians knew about this stuff a long time ago. Listen to this. There might not have been surgeries and hormone blockers, but long before there was transgenderism, there was transvestitism, right? What is transvestite? The, the Encyclopedia Britannica defines transvestitism as the practice of wearing the clothes of the opposite sex. Although the encyclopedia goes on to make a distinction between transvestitism from transsexuality, what we call transgenderism, nowadays, they recognize that the two are not necessarily distinct in practice. What is a transsexual going to do but dress like the sex they think they are? Well, why, well, why do I talk about transvestitism? Listen to Deuteronomy 22, verse 5. I'm going to share one verse with you. I'm probably going to share two, uh, knowing me. Uh, De Deuteronomy 22, verse 5 says this. A woman shall not wear a man's clothing. Nor shall a man put on a, woman, put on a woman's clothing. For, whatever, for whoever does this, these things, is an abomination to the Lord your God. Now, that's long before transgenderism came into play. God was already way ahead of it. In the law, God says this type of behavior is not just wrong, it's an abomination. It's wrong to the extreme. 
Dr. Edward Woods, in his commentary on Deuteronomy, writes the following. He says, this law reflects the blurring of mixtures at Leviticus 19.19. But here, its, its direct target is the wearing of any item, not limited to clothing, belonging to the opposite sex. This, this may have sought to discourage homosexuality or to, to prevent trans, transvestite practices found in the Canaanite and Mesopotamian worship as suggested by the word detestable. This type of stuff was going on millennia ago. Christians aren't clutching. We're not ignorant, clutching our pearls old-fashioned. God was way ahead of these cultural machinations and said they're wrong. Not a bunch of old-fashioned people around here. You see, God was dealing with the disposition and the psychology behind the actions. Why do people take hormone blockers? It's the psychology behind it. Why do they get surgery? It's the psychology behind it. And God was dealing with the psychology, the mindset that produced these type of behaviors. If you think incorrectly about yourself, you will do incorrectly to yourself. And stuff is the Old Testament. Some say, that, that's Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy is no longer in play. We good to go nowadays. Well, look at 1 Corinthians 6. <laughs> in 1 Corinthians 6, God is talking to the church of Corinth about not taking other Christians into court. And uh, so throughout this chapter, he's contrasting saved people with unsaved people. Then he reaches a point in the chapter we, where he gives this explicit statement about the, the, what the unsaved are like and the, that who will not inherit the kingdom of God and who the saved are like. The, and, the, and the saved are people who used to be that way but now have been transformed. Listen to, listen to how he starts his list. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9. Or do you not know that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals. Notice how effeminate and homosexuals are different. The effeminate here in this text are men, watch this, who present themselves as the opposite gender, female. They believed themselves to be female, although they were males, and acted on it. You saying, God, that, that our beliefs are old-fashioned? And God already addressed this here in the Bible? What our culture is doing hasn't, hasn't escaped God. God's not going, oh, I didn't know they were going to come up with, with that. Oh, yeah, he did. Yeah, he did. God was well aware. When it comes to modern times and how people define themselves, Christians are not naive. We're not clutching our pearls. We're not unaccustomed to the ways of the world. We are, in fact, immersed in the reality of the world and man's desire to define himself in ways he wants. We understand very well that the human condition, sorry, we, we understand very well the human condition and disagree for definite reasons with those who believe that human identity can be divorced from or be fully understood without a biblical worldview. We, we, it's, it's not that we're old-fashioned. We believe that to understand yourself Fully, you need to have a biblical worldview. Who am I? You are the union of the material and immaterial, a special creation of God, and living in light of that union and special status is necessary to have a holistic perspective on your life. This is what we need to believe, and this is what we need to teach our children to believe about themselves 
and our grandchildren to believe about themselves and to embrace. Only through this will we truly have a better understanding of what God has called us to be and do. Any questions before we close this evening? Yes. So how do you explain the Nephilim? How do you? The Nephilim. The Nephilim? Mm -hmm. Well, it depends on who you believe in the uh, Nephilim are. The, you have three uh, options. Uh, some believe that they, these were supernatural beings. I don't believe that. Uh, some believe that they were uh, the, uh, the offspring of uh, angels and men. And some believe that they were simply the, uh, the offspring of kings who had harems, sons of men who took as many women as they wanted to and had these harems. And so there's several ways you can understand it, but uh, I, would underst I would understand the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the Nephilim, the offspring, uh, as simply human beings. Uh, but they were human beings from a certain type of, I would argue, from a demonic relationship, but they were not demons themselves. That's a short answer, but I can go into more detail. So in a nutshell, are we saying that the fall, because of the fall, that causes us to have a distorted view who we really, who we truly are. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Yeah. Any other questions? Or, yes. This is uh, slightly off, but we have brothers and sisters, a lot of brothers, with, as a matter of fact, we're in a minority that think that we are just two things, material and immaterial. Um, and there are many Christians who think that we are three parts body, soul, and spirit. Do you think, you think there's a, uh, is, is, if you didn't, if you believe the other way that there were three parts, would you have gone through Genesis 1 and 2 in a different way? So, uh, as we kind of have a path to pass, for those of you who didn't hear his question, we, we have a little different view on how man is made up some Christians argue that man is made up of a, of a body, soul, and spirit. We argue that man is made of, of a body and an immaterial part. The immaterial part is sometimes called spirit, sometimes called soul, sometimes called mind, sometimes called bowels, sometimes called heart. It's all describing the same reality, which is immaterial. And so past question was, uh, if I believed in a tripartite division of man rather than a bipartite division of man, would I have approached Genesis differently. Um, <laughs> probably a, a little, normally what, again, I used to be tripart when I was a child, so uh, it's hard for me to think back what we, what we were taught, but uh, I would just, the way I would think that they handled Genesis is, is they would argue that the soul, because it's connected to, to the human body, was, uh, was, brought into existence when God formed them before he breathed into them. So God formed the, the, the uh, body, with the body was the soul that was tied to it, and then God breathed into the body, soul, life, and they became a living being. Uh, or something along that, or, 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 or the, they would argue that the body and then the, then the spirit is breathed in by God, and then they become a soul. And so there's several ways in which a tripartite person would argue. But as far as I'm concerned, the tripartite and bipartite, we're on the same team against the world. You know, whether you believe in two or three parts, we need to stand together against what we see going on in the culture and, uh, and, and to be, be witnesses and to help, to help young people, to help, well, and some older people too. We have some confused old, older people as well. Uh, to help people be able to understand themselves and to think of themselves rightly and not be caught up with how the world is trying to put its imprint and, its, and mold us into its, its viewpoint. So you're saying the third part is the breath, or what is it, what are you saying? The third no, part? I'm saying there's no third part. Oh, okay. I, I'm, I'm, saying, I'm saying what we teach here is that there's two parts. Okay. Immaterial, the, the soul, or the spirit, or the heart, whatever, whatever, it doesn't matter what you call it. It's the immaterial you, and then the body. So but what do you, when you're saying there's people who believe there's a tripart, what is it? So the, the, they would argue that there's a body, a soul, and a spirit. 
Two, oh, so the soul and the spirit would be different. Separate yeah. Okay. Two separate entities. Yeah. Open up a can of worms, man. <laughs> That's all right. Yes. I have a question, but it's just something that just came so so clear to me. I, is when we see where God fashioned man and breathed into that that fashion piece, and he became a living soul. Your mind sometimes wants to think of just a form, a physical form made from clay, and God breathes into it and he becomes a living uh, organism, if you please. But then I, start, I started to think of all the, the, the internal parts. Intricate, intricate, intricate parts of who we are. Right there. And <laughs> oftentimes you miss that, <laughs> yeah. think that way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it, it's not just a lump of clay. You know, I mean, did you just think about how the eye works. Yeah, I mean, I mean all, of those, all of those systems that make the eye functional were in the that body that was breathed into. Finished. So so with that statement, I went and just looked up uh, the composition of man as far as minerals and such. Mm. It was amazing. Uh, um, <laughs> all yeah, the incredible. earthly things that are in our bodies yeah. goes back to the dirt. It's, it's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. What a creator. What a creator. What a creation. Yeah. Our rightful response is worship. Go ahead. Just one more short comment. You know, you can't help but look around people who are who are just um, defacing themselves in different ways and orienting themselves in different ways and have no anchor points of, of thinking about who they are or answering the question of this conference. And and I I, I got to think a very high percentage of the problem is they ignore the immaterial part of themselves or have misdefined it. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, th th there's a lot that we could talk about as far as, um, you know, when a man, man's, man's we, we, we as evangelicals argue that, you know, God doesn't hear the prayers of an unsaved person, which, which we believe in that. Uh, we, you know, uh, there's no Christian nation. We do believe in that. But, but the idea of of a culture abandoning a God consciousness is a reality that Paul talked about. Yeah. I mean, th th that's the only way that you can make sense of Romans 1, is, is, is the abandonment of, of a Godward mindset. Even if it's a, a wrong Godward mindset, e even if it works, even if it fleshes it itself out in, in, in the, in the pre-World War II, you know, we gotta do what's right. Okay, it wasn't biblical, but, but, but there was a, a sense of right and wrong, uh, a sense that, that there is God out there. When, when, when you abandon any type of semblance of, of Godwardness, do you think the, the culture is not going to be impacted? No, it's going to be impacted. That's, that's, that's the reality of, again, that's the reality of, of, of Romans 1. But uh, th this gives us a wonderful opportunity for, for evangelism because we, we, we're offering people something different. They don't have to chase likes and thumbs up and uh, and applause. You know, I mean, our, our our world is 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 operating on the physical, and we offer people something completely different. Uh, the truth. Let me pray, and we will be dismissed. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for this evening, and we've gone over a lot of things tonight. We pray that as we meditate on this and kind of think through the ramifications of this, that you would um, just kind of rivet some of these things in our hearts, help us to understand them more clearly, and help us to be better conduits of your message of grace to the, a hurting world that needs to hear grace. You know, sometimes we condemn the world very, very well, but we don't offer much grace to the world. And I pray that we would offer that grace a way out of what they're in and that we would show them the love of God, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.